All right. 40th podcast. We got Darrell Hill. Big homie. <laughs> yes, indeed, bro. What's, What's up, going man? on? What's going on? What's up? You chilling in the car. You were just telling I know, me. Listen. Go ahead. I was, I was telling you either my best thoughts come one of two places. They either come in my car or they come on the toilet. And I figured that me sitting in my car would be uh, uh, a more pleasant uh, location for this for this, uh, this video. So, yeah, that's why I'm Thank in the car. I mean, thankfully, we don't have um, we don't have uh, what's it smell technology yet to just put yeah, it right. in place, or at least we right. don't. I actually do think that exists, but that's a different conversation. Right. Um, so thank you for being here, and course, hopefully, man, like we'll we'll get some good stuff out of this. So, I mean, I guess let's let's start with Corona, man. It's on everyone's mind. What's um, how are you dealing with that, like? Just personally at the center, like how's how's it affecting your life? Um, it's tough, man. You know, I'm I'm one person that tries to, uh, just in my personal in general, I try not to let too many things affect me. I try not to uh, be swayed too far one way with anything that's going on. You know, so for the longest portion of it, you know, my dad, because he's a parent, right? So he's always calling me like, "Hey, man, coronavirus is doing this. Coronavirus is doing that." Hey, man, they're, they're going to cancel their lips. They're going to cancel it. I'm just on the phone like, stop calling me. <laughs> then stop talking to me about this, right? And so, obviously, as, you know, time keeps going on, obviously, it starts to get closer and closer. Um, and it's it's real, man. It's tough. It's been tough, uh, obviously, because it's, it's it's officially rocked our world, you know, in, in the sports. Yeah. You know, like, I'm a huge sports fan, dude. Like, that's all I do is watch uh, sports shows and sports stuff. So, like, I can't have that. I can't lift in the weight room, you know. They it yeah, changed they the, the way the we eat. Huh? Yeah, they closed down the the cafeteria. Not the not the cafeteria, but we can't sit in the cafeteria. Like everything is uh, has changed about you know my daily routine. So uh, you know we're dealing with it, but you know we're just rolling. You know, trying to just follow the precautions, wash my hands, staying away from folks. Uh, you know, just just chilling for the most part. So really, we're just ahead of the curve. Just we should just be podcasting people anyway, talking about social. Right. Distancing. Exactly. <laughs> like, like that's what I'm saying. This is literally the perfect idea of social distancing, a virtual <laughs> podcast. Like, yeah. All right. So, um, how has it affected you though? Because I mean, you're also like, you know, you're not a podcast man, kid. But, like, you are kid the father. You are kid the coach. Kid the athlete. You know, like you are have a a lot of interesting dynamics that. Uh, have to come into play with this, you know, this virus. So how has it affected you? Many, many hats. Um, well, so Brooklyn, my oldest is in second grade. Right. Um, and it, it just, like most kids around the country, it, it happened to coincide with either the front end or back end of, of spring break. So, and also her, like most kids, she, they're going to distance learning, I think, like next week or something like that. Um, okay. So we're about to find out what, uh, you know, homeschooling is all about which isn't really that big of a deal because honestly like if we could or if we had you know the resources and, and if, if it was kind of a perfect world situation like we'd probably right. homeschool anyway um beyond that i mean img is is fairly locked down man like i think we've got a little over 1100 students and right now on campus we're like a little over 100 <laughs> Whew. wow everyone's gone home um, on the track team of 60, I think we have about 10 or 12 that are still on campus. So we still get our training in, but of course, like, so our, our gym shut down to, um, right. all the same things kind of at the center, but like, yeah, we were, we were wondering what was going to happen because like we're private, but it's still yeah. when mandates think, come think, from the government. A, I think you guys, yeah. I think, those, I think you guys had a longer leash, yeah. you know, cause when they, when they shut everything down, initially all the public businesses were like, okay, we're shutting it down. Right. And I think they started to crack down. Because I feel the same way about the train center. You know, like we were open uh, for a little bit after, you know, they told everybody all the gyms and stuff got to close. So we were still lifting for a while. And I was just like, okay, like, you know, maybe we'll be able to keep rolling. And then, you know, next thing you don't know, no. then they shifted some weights outside. Then literally just the other day, they said, you can't even do the lifting outside. Like, you can't I, lift outside. Bro, yeah. that's messed like, up. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> I mean, the news is literally like 
24 hour fresh. So I haven't even gotten an opportunity to kind of maneuver about how we figure that out, but we'll figure it out. We'll figure Man. Out. Right. I mean, um, I made this joke with someone like between training with Dr. B for all, all that time. And also just like being overseas and on the circuit for, you know, a significant period of time. Like this is yeah. kind of what training is, man. You just do what you can do. Yep. <laughs> you're, you're yep. out in the middle of nowhere and you've got a kettlebell or you've got a right. couple rocks. You know what I mean? Like you just do what you gotta right. do. It's not optimal, but you know, the end of the season during those times, like it still works anyway, you know, for the most part. Not for sure. I mean, listen, it, it's unfortunate, you know, but it is what it is, you know, like we've, we've grown accustomed to these traditional uh, training methods, you know, barbells and, and weights and everything, man. But uh, true essence of strength isn't, isn't about, you know, the weights you move. It's about how it's about you moving at the core, you know, and, you know, so if, as long as we keep moving, man, we'll be all right. We'll figure it out. I would actually take that a step further and say the mindset that goes into that, right? When, when your, when your world gets rocked, just like everyone's world just got rocked. How do you yeah. rise to that? Right? Some people, I mean, for whatever dude, reason, I'm, some people can't rise. And that's okay. Straight, I almost tweeted this yesterday, but then I didn't, you know, because I was like, whatever. But I'll tell you, to you I was like, man, I'm learning so much about a lot of people right now. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Truthfully, you know, I'm learning, I'm learning, so I, but I was just like, you know what, the, I don't need to tweet that, it's okay, but I just know I am, like, I am watching people respond, talking to people, you know, personally, and watching people, how they're reacting to things, and I'm just like, man, you guys are, you know, you guys are not as, not as mentally tough, or, you know, as, you know, everybody's mentally tough to a degree, but like, you know, there's only a few people that are up here, like, I, I'm starting to see a lot of people are just like, you know, are comfortable with in, in their stable environment. But when things change, you know, they're not as stable as they might appear. I'm starting to see a lot of that. That's, that, that's my take on that. And there is a direct correlation to performances and kind of when, when you know, I don't know, grit, you know, digging, yeah. digging getting things done. Right. Um, so you, have you had ex throwing, like, let's, let's, let's rewind here. Penn State, you're from Philly. Right. Mm -hmm. Did you start, like, shot put disc, football, wrestling? Like, tell me how you kind of got started in throwing. Um, so, growing up, I played basketball because we had uh, weight limit football teams, and I was a heavy kid, right? And I've, I've been the same way my whole life. I've always just been dense. So, I've always carried more weight than it might have appeared. So, I was a heavy kid, you know. So, like, above 140, like, you know, I couldn't play. So, I just played basketball. Uh, as a kid growing up, and then I got in high school, and I did everything, man. Like, I wrestled for a period of time. I tried baseball. Uh, I played football when I got to high school. You know, like, I, I just – I literally did everything, like, except soccer. I did everything except soccer. And uh, I was in my – like, the end of my sophomore year of high school, the high school coach asked me, like, hey, man, come – like, can you come help us out? You're a big dude. We got this league championship or whatever. Uh, we don't have nobody throwing. All you got to do is come toss this ball, and you get to just hang out with girls here. You know, with he sold it to me just like this. <laughs> and so I was, I was like, I mean, all right. And I had friends on the team, so it was no, no problem. Uh, I said, cool. You know, I went up, and this is not that crazy story where you know you. I went out and it was love at first sight, and I won. I put, it's like no, I went up. I got like fourth. Uh, I didn't throw that far. You know, I do like thirty something feet. And it was just like, whatever. But, I, you know, on a bus ride back, our team had great energy. You know what I'm saying? Like, our coach, was, he was a good dude. So he was funny. Like, all my homies, you know, it was just a good vibe. So I said, okay. Like, he asked me if I wanted to come to the next one. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, yeah, I'll come check it out. Like, you know, that was a fun time. And same kind of deal. And then uh, next thing you know, the season was over. And then we went to junior year. And then instead of wrestling, I just said, nah, I'm just going to go do indoor track. Like, that was more fun. And then uh, naturally being competitive, how I am. Obviously, I play football throughout the whole time. Um, and I think my as I took football more seriously, it just naturally translated athletically over into me getting better in the throws. Um, and also just the conversations that I was having with the people in school, you know, we started getting more serious about trying to go to college. But it was always about football. Yeah. Right. It was always about trying to go to the next level, play football, try to go to the NFL. I mean, I was around some elite athletes in my high school. We had a bunch of 
we probably have like six or seven dudes in my high school with D1 offers in sports. You Dang. know, and from, from, I mean, that's, that's what I'm saying. That's not that common. So we had a elite, you know, athlete group, you know, and we're looking around and everybody's talking about all these college offers they got right now. I don't have any. And so I'm like, you know, I've always been, it's not envious for me. It's just like, I take, look at other people's success and it makes me want to go get my own. It's like, I wanted to join those conversations and be like, I got this going on. So like, it was never even really about trying to throw shop before. It was just about trying to, you know, fit in truthfully. Um, and so as I took football more seriously, uh, started to get stronger, the ball started to go further. Uh, and then the school started to call and then the football schools, they called less and, you know, opportunities, open doors, and here we are today. What um, what position did you play? Uh, right guard and defensive tackle. Nice. Yeah, I can see that working. Yeah. Uh, so, there were uh, – how old are you? So, TJ? Was TJ at Penn State, right? He recruited me. He recruited me, but he was not there when I got there. Okay. And then yeah. who was – Patrick Ebel. Evil. Coach that, he coaches at Auburn now. Yep. Right. right. Mm-hmm. There was an in between, and now, now we got uh, one of my best friends, Lucas, there. Um, right. What was life like? How many years did you and Joe uh, overlap there? It wasn't all of them, was it? No, we never overlapped there. Actually, we literally. Oh. He was my he was my college host. You know, when I went on a visit in high school, and then I ended up going to University of Houston first and transferred over. But right when I transferred, he had just left. Like I got there. January 1st, New Year's Day of 2013. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he had just left to go to the training center in December of 2012. Okay. So, literally, he just left. I come in to, uh, January 1st, uh, if I'm not mistaken. That, that, could, that could be inaccurate, but whatever. That's what I believe. Um, <laughs> so, we didn't, we, didn't over, we didn't overlap there at all. But then, obviously, you know, we got to work together after school. Um. So what was tough about, like, if anything, but I'm sure something was, not only getting to university, um, but kind of managing, right? Because, like, you know, you're on your own, essentially. Um, yeah. You got to go to class. You kind of look after yourself. You got to eat. You got to go to practice and also perform right. and stay up. What was that like? Um, I mean, it was tough getting there because, you know, the school I came from, I mean, like, there were, we had people going to school, but, like, they don't tell you till late, you know, like you like for me, I was such a late bloomer that like, I was just a cool kid in school. You know, if I'm being truthful, I played sports, but I was, I was more interested in being cool. You know, it's like my grades weren't all that good. I was intelligent, but you know, as far as it goes to getting to college, you know, it's only about what that score says. They're not sitting, they're not interviewing, you You know, so you're putting it in an application. Right. So it's probably me late, by the way. <laughs> right. You know, like, so, they, they, I start, I started to get better late. So now I'm focusing on trying to get my grades better, get my grades better. And luckily for me, it wasn't too little, too late. I was able to salvage it and make things work. Um, but just that whole process of figuring out where you want to go, where you want to be, you know, like everybody's selling you, you know, they're selling you, right? So trying to find a proper fit for, uh, for me, you know, was, uh, I can imagine that could be tough for a lot of kids. It was, it was a little tough for me, but I, I think I ended up in the right place. But getting into school, like being in school, just the overall managing, you know, especially like as a freshman, right? Because you're going to college, you've got all these perceptions of what college is. And outside of that, you got responsibility. And you've never had this much responsibility because you've never lived on your own. Um, you've never, for me, when I went to University of Houston, I didn't even have a meal plan. I had to cook my own food. So as a um, freshman. Yeah, so we had like an apartment style. So it was, I mean, it worked out. I had, my, we had a roommate, but I had my own room and we had like a little apartment style. Thing. Yeah. And so I had to cook my own meals um, and I had to be on time for places. I had to, you know, just figure out how I was going to get there. I also was across the country, you know, so just trying to manage all those things was a task in itself. You know, obviously you have support, you have to, you know, they understand. They, hopefully you go to a good school and those people understand your situation so they navigate you and help you through all those things, but trying to find a balance between athletics, uh, social life, and, and school, you know, is, is, the, is the overall balance game. And how well you can do that is probably going to reflect on how well you're doing sports. Yeah, I mean, you know, because if you don't do well at that, then the opportunity is taken away, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> and like, and I tell yeah. my kids, I think that's part of 
uh, why I appreciate the role that I'm in. I mean, I don't know, at least currently, like with, with high school age athletes is like, you can, you can have, you know, the best grades in the world, but once you get to university, man, like you still got to put it in. Um, speaking from personal experience, like my family growing up was always fairly strict and it was, it was, uh, regimented, but like not from a military standpoint, just, you know, I mean, you kind of know how it is, right? Like you just yeah. like, it, it's, it's your parents and your grandparents way. And like, and that's just the way, right. There isn't much, right. I'll speak for myself now. There wasn't much room for me to kind of give my own input. And yeah, so yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And, they always, they do know better than you. Well, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and you know, a lot of times they do, but like, let's, let's right. be honest. Right. And, um, and I think from kindergarten, so uh, me graduating high school, I think I missed only five days of school. That's impressive, bro. But I'm saying, <laughs> right? But like, you know, my dad's like a doctor and it's just like, you know, anytime that I was sick or feeling crappy, it was like, no, you're going to school. Like, you're not, you're not right. dead. You know what I mean? <laughs> so yeah. it's like, oh, okay. So anyway, you know, you do whatever. And, and I go to Georgia and it was like, uh, what? Like, right. my first class is that. I don't know, seven or something. I was like, yeah, like that, that first, I probably missed more school in the I don't know, first two weeks of college than, than my entire high school career. Uh, <laughs> but like you live and you learn. Right. And so, and yeah. that opportunity that I absolutely like relished and the coaches that I loved and the athletes um, and the teammates that I loved, like it was, it was no longer there. Right. Because of my own actions. And that's just one of those mm-hmm. things that like, you know, I don't know if I would, I don't really believe that I would change it. I think it led me down the absolute perfect path that I should have gone down. Um, right. But those are just kind of the risks that you run. You know what I mean? No, yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. And I would, I would say the same thing. I mean, I think, I don't know if you get to be the, the person you are today if you don't have that experience, you know, like, yeah, that's just, that's just how life works. You know, like you, you go through things like that and, it's always unfortunate in the time being, but it shapes you and it develops you. And then you, you, you go to a different situation. And I mean, look, your career in college, dude, was like, you know, it was, it was fire. <laughs> I mean, but it was like, it was like, yeah, it was like three years long total out of the. <laughs> hey man, but it was like, it's, you, you're still up there, bro. You got, you did some, you did some work. And then, you know, to become one of the greatest American hammer throwers that we've ever seen. So, you know, it was, it was whatever, how I need to look like, but. Oh my God! Sorry, bro. You dropping out? Yes. I. I mean, how can I turn my? Your phone dying? No, I just somebody called me. Right. I want to make sure. I want to make sure that that doesn't happen. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but. Yeah, where was I? Yeah, so yeah, I think this, this opportunities and things like that shape who you are. So I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to change anything like that either. Even my path, I feel the same way. Yeah. So all right, so Penn State, um, you've graduated. Everything's pretty much wrapped up there. Like, was there, was there options? Like, basically, what was, what was your thought process? going from university to a training group? Like, was it always going to the center first and foremost? Or did you like, you know what I mean? Kind of juggle anything else? Uh, no, it wasn't like that at all. Truthfully, man, I didn't really, at first I didn't have any plans on leaving. I mean, like I had watched Ryan Whiting, uh, you know, be successful in that environment, you know? So I kind of saw how you could, uh, you know, shape a professional career in State College, Pennsylvania. You know, I had seen it be done. And I really liked, you know, working with Coach Evil. So I didn't feel like I was missing out on anything, feel like I needed to go chase anything, you know. It was just uh, I was comfortable in my environment, and it was my own. So I didn't initially want to go anywhere. Uh, but I had met Art Venegas in 2014 uh, at a meet in Arizona. And uh, this was my personal best was at this moment it was uh, 1913. Uh, and he had, you know, stopped me and talked to me and told me, like, you know, he'd want to work with me. And I just always, as things went forward, right, and I become this 20 AD shot putter, 21 meter guy, whatever, uh, I never 
was lost on the fact that this dude seen me at 19 meters and said, you're the guy I want to work with, right? So, like, it never it, – it always flipped in my brain. I said, this dude must know something. You know, like, he saw yeah, me at yeah. this point. And, uh, and obviously – and then also, you think about the timing. I, had, you know, I was there, Joe, through twenty-two for the first time at USA two thousand fourteen that year. So I'm watching this relationship with a guy I respect, who's Joe, uh, blossom with this coach. And I'm like, I mean, listen, I get to go. Part of the reason I came to Penn State was because of Joe. So I'm like, I get to go live in California at the training center for free, um, learn from one of the greatest coaches of all time, work with Joe while he's in his prime. Uh, you know, Richard Gare was there, and listen, more. Uh, Obviously, I wanted to work with Joe. A lot of people don't really know Richard Garrett or whatever. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But he's the black guy in the group. Yeah. And I'm I'm a black guy, right? So, and I watched him in, in college in 2014. Uh, you know, big energy guy. He's throwing real far. So, I'm reaching out to him. And I'm like, bro, I, I would love to train with you. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, and Tia Brooks was there. I was like, this is literally like, it's made for me. There's black people here. Yeah. I never, you know, like, you know, Joe is here, coach is here. So, uh, and I, I talked to Art on the phone, and uh, we talked about a technical issue that I was having, uh, and I asked him if he could help me, and he said he could, and I said, all right, I'll be there next week. And originally, I was supposed to just be there for about a two-week uh, kind of period, and then I got out here, and then, yeah, I just didn't leave. <laughs> I mean, it was the Olympic year, so it was, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's literally, I got here March 23rd of 2016, I remember. And we're working, it's like the middle of April. And I'm just like, yeah, dude, like, I don't, you know, I don't want to leave, you know. It's unfortunate. You saw that much, like, improvement or either uh, either improvement or just kind of feeling, like, where it's going to go? What? what yeah, just the, convers that? just the conversations, right? And uh, I'm just, I'm a good soldier, right? So if you can, if you can paint the picture for me and I see it, I'll buy in, right? But it, it's got to make sense because yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a deep thinker. I do my homework. So like you gotta you gotta show me in a way that you know I can believe, and the stability of the environment sold me, you know, in itself, right? You know, I everything's controlled. We got housing that we ain't gotta worry about. We got food, you know. We got this group and everything. I'm listening to our talk, and he's just got plans. He's mapping things out, and he's helping me. He's putting together plans for me. So outside of the technical things that he was showing me, you know, it was more. It was it was a holistic view. I seen the, the the vision for a whole thing, and I said I could be a part of this group, and we could build this thing and keep going. So, I I was able to see that in two weeks for sure. So, <clears throat> how was that transition then going from? I mean, it sounds like it was probably pretty uh, seamless. <laughs> if you went there for for what are their short periods? Right. Um. It was. It was not seamless. <laughs> it was. Okay. It was. Seamless. At first, uh, it was seamless. At first, I was here, and then we had bumps, man. You know, because we had bumps with USATF. Uh, there was a period of time at the end of April uh, where, you know, like so. Obviously, there was conversations I had with Art and the guys at USATF when I was out there for the couple week period. I was like, "Yeah, I want to, I want to stay here." Uh, and they had offered me to come there early in the year, also. So, you know, I was under the impression that the communications were made, you know, about me being able to stay, uh, etc. So I got it was about. Yeah, I think it was about the end of April or so when I was going to a Dick Sporting Goods event in Pittsburgh. I flew out. I'm there. And I got a phone call from the training center. Like, hey, like, you know, you left some things in the room. Uh, you know, we put them in trash bags and they're, and they're by ACI. Like, or, if you want to come back and pick them up. And I'm like, trash bags? What are you talking about? Like, I, I gotta, I'm got i coming back tomorrow. Like, they're like, oh, no, we don't. We only have you here, like, for this day, like. So I'm on the phone with Duffy. And I'm like, hey, what's going on? Like, you know, I thought we figured this out. And he's just like, nah. And so I'm like, I'm like, like, what you mean? Like, what you mean, kind of, what you mean, nah? And he's just like, nah, we, we don't got it figured out. You know, it's not, we don't have it in the budget. Uh, it's all funny now, right? He's like, man, he's like, we don't have it in the budget. Nah, we can't do it. We can't do it. So I'm like. And at that time, how many empty beds were there? I mean, there's a, you know, it's a, it's a, there's a ton of empty beds. It's like they, they have beds in the, uh, in the brain of beds they want to pay for. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so it's not about there being a physical bed because my bed was there. <laughs> like, <laughs> I had my, like, I had my stuff on my bed. So it wasn't about, you know, them needing my bed. It was about them wanting to pay uh, the money for me to be there. And they didn't see it. And uh, I'm, I'm talking back and forth with these guys. So 
now I'm back in Philly uh, for like, you know, I went back for pen relays and I'm gaining weight and I'm home and I'm stressed. And so I'm home literally the whole month of May. This is May of the Olympic year. Oof. Yeah, it's May of the Olympic year, right? And I'm on the phone with Art, and he's just like, dude, don't worry about it. We're trying to figure it out. We're trying to figure it out. I'm on the phone with Duffy like every other day. Like, come on, man. Like, let's figure this out. I'm trying to do this. I'm like, you got the coach at the Olympic Training Center telling you, if I work with this guy, we can get him on the team. And at this point, I mean, I was probably the, you know, I was a top, I got like fifth at USA the year before. So it's not like I was not anybody you know what i'm saying so i'm like okay cool which i figured out and i get back at the end of may i think i had a end of may they were like yeah you can come out from june 1st to the olympic trials so i'm like okay so i'm there june 1st we're working and i go to trials with all my bags because you know that was my day right and then you know we seen it the way the trials when i made the team and then literally it was so funny. I'm with the team processing the next morning. And so I'm like, hey, you know, hey, Robert Chapman, like, what's going on? Like, like oh, we, we got to figure it out. I was like, oh, yeah, right. We should right, so put the monies around. <laughs> yeah, right. So they figured it out. You know, so it wasn't seamless. And uh, I think our Olympic experience was also a bit different because I had gotten to that point by following this program and it was Joe's program if I'm just being truthful I came in March you know so I'm just riding the coattails of Joe and Art doing a thing doing a thing and I think we got to the Olympics and I had different needs yeah. than Joe and uh, I didn't voice them for a while it took me about a week into us being in Brazil for me to kind of be like yo I am like breaking down like physically I'm like my body is like not responding the way you know it needs to we made some adjustments but I just think you know, like just, adjustments like like is this uh, like a health and wellness? No, I just think we got off. It, I think it was health and wellness. I mean, we we got off the plane, uh, and mind you, we flew there. The flight was not that comfortable. It took a while to get down there. We got straight off the plane, drove that whatever hour to the track, and we were like running that night. Yeah. And then we had like practice the next morning, and we had a double. We had a double session the next morning, and it, it was just so much. And I'm just like, mind you, I told you I was gaining weight back in, in May from all this stress. So I'm like, I'm heavy. Um, I'm, I'm doing a lot. My back's tight. You know, like just everything's just kind of stacking one on it. I'm not saying anything because I'm like, stick to the plan. The plan is the plan. The plan. I've got here by following this plan. Yeah. So I'm not voicing my opinions on that until about, you know, a weekend and then everything is just kind of, there were some highs. You know, there were some highs, but it was a lot of up and down and I think that was kind of why my Olympic experience didn't go to where I wanted it to go, but it was a big learning opportunity for me, and I was thankful for it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's good because, I mean, you know, everyone talks about like like buying and and having a coach, and all of that is great and it's absolutely necessary. But there, it, it can't be lost on the athlete to kind of trust that instinct. Right. Um, but you know, also by that same token, like trusting that instinct takes practice, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and it's just one of those things that you can't be, I mean, you just can't be too flippant about, uh, about what's going on. So, I mean, you took, did you take anything away from that? Like, is this, you, you need more rest time in between sessions or like after travel days, actually speaking of travel days, how about you guys got like the, um, I don't know, the, the first class or whatever the tickets to go down there, or was it just like, no, so for the Olympics, I, they, they, I think in Rio, they weren't doing that. They, uh, they got like two seats or something like that. They were buying two seats, I think. So, so maybe, it no started in, maybe it started in 17 then. I, I think they had done it. But I think they had done it before, and they did it after, but they did not do it in, in Rio. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yep. So it was like, uh, yeah, so I, but I definitely, t- I, de- I took a ton from that. I took a ton from that. And even, like, that was a, a big building block for our relationship, coach-athlete relationship. You know, we talked, and I t- and I voiced the same thing. That's why I don't have, I don't place fault on any yeah. of the decisions that, because I understood, you know, like, and he, like I told you, a good soldier. I'm just rolling with the punches. I'm, I'm following the plan, following the plan. So in his brain, he's got an athlete. We're doing his plan. His plan's working. 
you know, and it had been working. Things were well. So it's not like things weren't working. It was just that there was one bump. Like, we got to this one part, and, you know, I just so happened to be a different athlete, and I didn't respond the same way. Um, and that was a big learning moment for us, you know, just about what I might need. You know, even just in the in the social aspect, you know, uh, Joe's militant. You know, Joe and Art, they have a very, they had a very militant relationship uh, as far as, like, we're here, we're here, we're not hanging out, we're not doing that, you know, here this time, here this time. We spent so much time training and just kind of being in our rooms and being out the way. And if you, you know me, that's not me, you yeah. know. So, like, I'm not, I'm just, I'm just down here kind of, you know, I'm locked in, I'm focused, but I'm like, this is what I got to do. This is how I got here. Boy. Locked in. And I'm like, I'm not being as social as I. Uh, am accustomed to being, I'm not, you know, having as much fun. I'm not, you know, there are so many things that make me perform well that I'm not doing. Like, and so that was just a, a big learning moment for us moving forward. So we get to Worlds in 2017. It was the funniest thing in the world because we get there and he's like, hey, when do you want to practice? <laughs> and I just laughed, right? <laughs> just like, hey. He said, hey, listen, he said, me and Joe are practicing at this time. You know, you are more than welcome. But when we, what's your, what would you like? I'm like, ah, here we go. Now, now we talk, you know, like, hey, we doing this? And I'm like, nah, I'm going to play cards. <laughs> like, I see how I practice tomorrow. Like, you know, and it's just like, and that was just helping, you know, and it, it, that's just who I am. I like to just chill and, and do me. But, you know, that was just a big learning moment for our relationship. For sure. Man, I think that's awesome. Because, like, I mean, and I'm, I'm, man, I met Art when I was 17 years old. And, right. um. And just knowing him through the years, I don't know if I have gotten like firsthand knowledge of him kind of like learning or adapting something like that. Not that it's never existed. I'm just saying I, I don't know. But like, I think that's a great example of um, an experienced, awesome, amazing, you know what I mean? Coach of all time kind of person. Yeah. Um, yeah. Having the conversation with you listening to the things that you got to say and probably you know what i mean and, and maybe at first he was like yeah no and then and then later thought about it or maybe he was it was a you know conversation from the very beginning but ultimately obviously deciding like you know what if this is what's best for Darrell, or at least if, if Darrell thinks that this is what's best for him then we should probably try it at least and see and i think it, i think it was just i think it was a little easier because it was I wasn't coming with anything too far left field. You know what I'm saying? It was just like, uh, hey, well, he knows me, right? So now at this moment, so we get into the Olympics. We've spent three months together, right, of just knowing each other personally, like spending days, you know, days and days out. And you get to Worlds in 2017, and we got about a year and a half into our relationship. So you know now who I am, how I function personally, you know, what type of emotional, mental state I should be in for me to perform my best. Because you've seen it in training. You've seen it, uh, you know, you just watched it happen. So if I tell you, like, you know, he knows I'm not doing anything stupid. I'm like, yo, listen, I'm just going to go play cards and kick it with my friends. Um, and then I'll see y'all at practice at three. And he's just yeah. like, cool. And I come to practice at three and I light it up. Yeah. And so he's just like, all right, that makes sense. And, he just, and I'm telling him, like, Instead of me doing back to back, you know, I perform well when I do one on one off, one on one off, and so we've done it throughout the season. So he knows, you know, I respond well when I have a high intensity day of rest, high intensity day of rest. You know, but you've so, experimented with all of it, right? So exactly. Yeah. So you know, the adjustments we're talking about making. You know, I'm not saying, you know, hey, coach, I think I do best if I just chill for four days and then, I, you know, it's, it's not anything crazy. I'm just like, yo, listen, that's too much. What if we can shift this right here? We writing the money. So he's just like, easy. That's cool. So it was, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was good to see and good to live for sure. Nice. Are you, uh, are you, do you like having a trainer partner or are you a lone wolf? <laughs> uh, I love having a trainer partner. Uh, I've grown to be a, uh, I've grown to work well by myself. But to me, you know, if you just harken back to the conversation we had about how I first came into the sport, it's always been about the people that I get to interact with, you know. So uh, in my perfect world, you know, having an elite training partner is, is yeah. it. I'm an environment guy, like all of that. So I love having training partners. How does, how, like, how does that interact on a daily basis? So, I mean, 
I feel like it's kind of interesting. And actually, it doesn't really, in, in this generation of hammer throwers, it hasn't really existed. Um, and I think, right. you know, maybe with Sean at the center, it's, it's kind of bridged that gap. But like, you know what I mean? So in my time, it was me and AG. And then prior to that was, uh, was Kevin and James. Well, actually, Kevin and James didn't train together. But then like Lance and, and Judd, they spent a significant amount of time out of a year, right? They didn't live in the same town, but they would, they would train together a lot. There was always like that kind of, that other. <laughs> and, and if I'm being like perfectly honest, like when, when you've got two people like that, they're usually pretty different. Right, right. Um, so like, <laughs> yeah. so what's going on? Like, is there, is there someone like that, you know? I mean, I guess Joe, but you, you're not training with Joe anymore. Correct. Um, so, I mean, I train with, so, right, at this moment, I train with uh, Nick Scarvelis, Datun, Agandiji, he's a Nigerian guy with UCLA, uh, and Raven Saunders. And we all fit well because uh, we're friends, you know, we're all friends for sure, but we have common interests. Uh, me and Nick are probably the, the closest out there, too, you know, because we've spent the most time training together. I've been working with him since 2018, so... You know, we spent the most time together, and we are a bit different. You know, we're definitely a bit different, so it works. Um, but, yeah, like, you, at, at, at the highest of highest levels, I can only just say me and Joe. And uh, it worked well because, you know, we're from the same same place, kind of. You know, we're from Pennsylvania. We're Penn State guys. We got so many things in common. Uh, and we're both really competitive, and we, we, we feed – competitively in two different ways you know what i'm saying like i was able to uh to push joe because i'm a trash talker he's not a trash talker <laughs> you know not, not not most times right yeah, yeah. but to have somebody that's always kind of barking at your heels you know there's not much downtime you know what i'm saying like it's you know or there's just always somebody there you know so those type of things i appreciate the most about relationships but yeah, we we don't have that currently in the hammer throw and i think it'd be dope you know i shot like sean Don's here i love sean Don's here. yeah um but we don't have like you know like connor and rudy or like sean don and you know like there's so it's just kind of him and he's got another uh, another guy training down there but it's not that you know like yeah, UNAG, yeah, you, you need to be, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. the same yeah you need to be knocking on the door of best in the u.s for that kind of thing right uh, it's tough though it's tough it's tough man Oh. It would it would it would be nice, um, and I think that was kind of part of what we were trying to um, check off of, like the Hammer Initiative when we started this a few years ago. Um, but all of all of our guys now are are so spread across the U.S. Um, yeah. And so it was like, well, let's at least try to get them together to train for a little bit. And so, and I mean, and honestly, in that sense, it, it it's been okay. But like, you know, our trips have been you know, 10 days or something like that for the last. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but even those, like there, there were a couple of moments that were pretty eye opening for some of the athletes, you know what I mean? And just realizing and, and having conversations about, you know, what this guy does versus what this guy does. Um, yeah, for sure. For you know, sure. In Europe and having those I think, I think it's, I think it's huge, man. Like I know for a fact, dude, like I have learned, and I'm not the cool t kid that's too cool to talk about where they learn things from. And I learned so much from watching Ryan Whiting uh, have some of the best years of his professional career while I was in college at Penn State. I learned so much from training with Joe, you know, outside of throwing, you know, but like even in throwing movement and, and regimen and discipline and coach-athlete relationship, you know, on a professional scale. Uh, the inner workings of businesses and contracts and how those things work. I mean, there's so much that I've learned from uh, my time spent around other elite shot putters. You know, so those type of relationships are invaluable, dude. Invaluable. But you got to check your egos at the door, for sure. Yeah, exactly, man. Um, what was your steepest learning curve? Like, you know, Emerging like post collegiate, you know what I mean. Before you're you're a 22 meter guy, and and and, and in general, but like what what did you need to learn and see and kind of integrate yourself to kind of become the guy that you are now? Ooh, I think I think I just I think well I think I might have just overcome this one thing right, and it's competing on lar the largest stages right because for me I don't get overly nervous. And, like, I get excited. I don't get overly nervous. So it's not really about 
you know, like, but I also in saying that, right, you look back at my performances at the, the highest levels and they haven't always connected the way I wanted them to. Even this past one, although I got fifth place in the greatest competition ever, you know, they haven't always connected how I wanted to, but I've never been out there feeling like overwhelmed or that, you know, a moment was too big. So uh, just those small details about, because that's what it really is. These Olympic Games and World Championships, you know, I have so much more respect for the people who win and the people who do great at those championships because it's more logistics than it is about shape and and, and how far you can grow. Yeah, you know man. what I'm saying? <laughs> at, the, at, at the core and essence of it, right, it's about that, right? But that's the, like, that's the last box you got to check. Like, it's flying to all these foreign countries. It's, you know, training in Doha at 8 p.m. Uh, and it's, 112 degrees and humidity you know what i'm saying like it's all those things and then figuring out how you're going to recover um and then it's about going and warming up at a track across the street taking a bus into a stadium and then you only get a few warm-ups or the people don't speak english so you don't know how many warm-ups you're going to get you know it's so many procedural things uh and then competing in october you know what I'm saying? So, so many procedural things that you have to check off before you even get an opportunity to take your first attempt in a competition, right? So, the steepest learning curve for me is was how to navigate through uh, qualification rounds and all of those moments, you know, to get an opportunity to start a competition and feel like you are prepared to put forth your best effort. That was my steepest learning curve. And I think I just overcame that this past year in Doha. All right. Yeah. Um, so what advice would you have to give? Because cause here's the other thing, too, is it's easy for the athletes that have been there and been on, at, at, the, at, the, you know, at the three majors to, to say, right. hey, this is what you got to do in prelims and, like, this is kind of what you want to feel, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But, like, talking about it, like, it ain't the same. It, it just isn't. Um, Correct. But, like, I mean, I think you can still – Basically, the question is for you. What would you say? Like, what advice are you going to give to a kid who's still in university and is like, what's it like? Like, what, what do I got to do to, you know, get out of regionals so I can go to Eugene or something for the 17th time? <laughs> I, w- I would say, truthfully, I would say really, really find a technical model that is truly comfortable for you. <laughs> Um, because the comfort that you can find in that technical model will give you a confidence that you can take wherever you're trying to go, right? So um, they put the a qualifying standard at 2090, the auto mark, um, and it was the highest. It might have been the highest it's ever been, right? That's really high for an oh, auto mark. Yeah. What I understood, truthfully, that if I just get across the ring properly, get in the right uh, technical position, and I hit the ball the right way, that there's no way I'm going to throw under 21 meters. I understood that. So all of those procedural things that I talked about that get in the way, right, you're dealing with all those things, but you understand that I I have a comfort in my move. So, like, as long as I get to the ring and, you know, I'm warm, you know, I'm able to move in a way that I'm so comfortable that I'm able to throw. So I would say – change your training to where, you know, you take more rest because that's the other thing. We get in the ring, we throw, we'll take a throw. You know, you walk and get your implement, you take another throw, but that is not how it works. Like, actually ever at, at major competition. Yeah. You know, especially qualifying, right? You got 16 people, you know, that's that's how it always is. It's always going to be 16 people. How you fast know, is it for your... you guys? How fast is it for you guys when, when they're running two rings? So, like, in Hammer, you know, we've got 15 to, you know, 17 I've had it a couple times, I think. And, I mean, it's legit uppers of about 30 minutes. Yeah. Is it, is it about so that they're, not, they're not always running two rings. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, like, so they didn't run two rings in Doha. They had two different qualification groups. But even so, right, even so, say they are running two rings. Only, whatever they're running, you just focus on, you know, your one group, a group of 16 people or whatever. Yeah. And so you take a throw – and it's probably about 20 minutes or so before your next attempt, yeah. you know, truthfully. So rhythm is tough to find. You know, it's tough to get, especially in a qualifying round where you got stressed. Thanks, you know, you didn't, you know, you, you've been dealing with all the warm-ups and how weird that is, right? So your first attempt isn't good. 
The next thing you know, you got 20 minutes until your next attempt. You're still not warm. You don't have any rhythm. And then hopefully you catch that one. You might get a little more rhythm, but that's only because you've had two competition issues. But now you got the third throw, and now you're stressed because you need to get a mark. So right. qualification rounds can come and go like that. Um, so I would say take more time, you know, in between your throws. You know, be comfortable with uh, resting and pacing. Uh, you know, try not to have so many external folk forces that help you throw far, like loud music or I gotta have this, I gotta have that, because you never have get that. Wendy's frosty every morning. <laughs> like you can't, you you really can't have a gotta have. Like you yeah, you, you no. kind of need to gotta have nothing. Like all you need to gotta have is you're implementing your shoes. Like you need to become that guy. That all I need to throw is my implement and my shoes, and I'll be all right. You know. So try to get rid of all that extras, and I think that'll, you know, that'll help you out a bit. Next thing you know, you're just looking at the ring, and you're like, it's seven feet like every other ring up there. Every single one. So um, how do you feel? So, I mean, over the years, I think you hear a lot, and I don't know if I've had legitimate conversations with, um, with shop, like actual shoppers, like elite ones, you know what I mean? So right. you hear, so the difference between in the age old argument rotational glide at a major championship and you know one camp says glides better because the rhythm is not as whatever and, and spinners you know it's easy to lose rhythm because you have to wait so long and all of these things and it's rotational and like so like how do you feel about that because having not thrown shot really um I feel like I would play devil's advocate in that in that kind of argument, but I'm also like, but like I never threw it far, so I, you know, I'll, I'll defer. I'll say, I'll say this. I'll say this, dude. Like, like you know, technically, are they correct? I mean, yeah, correct. You know, like yeah, there is less forces and things that can change, so technically, the glide is a more consistent and dependable and reliable model, right? That's that's true. You know, but that probably be like saying doing a one turn is a more reliable option in doing four turns it's like yeah technically because you got less movement so like yeah it is more reliable and more dependable and consistent but it also doesn't have the same uh velocity patterns and that allows you to create force and throw further so which one would you rather have i mean yeah it takes it's tougher to to be a rotational thrower at the highest level right but if you can be that guy at the highest level and figure out how to move properly and confidently you have a higher ceiling and opportunity pr to produce distance than this guy over here. I mean, and the proof is just in the results. We didn't have any gliders in our final, if I'm not mistaken. Like, we would have probably had Davis Thorl if he was, you know, healthy and throwing, but uh, he is, you know, he always has that, the last glider. You know, there's, yeah. there's not many, there's not many more uh, guys throwing a 7.26 that are gliding. So, I kind of want to find one. I mean, that'd be a that'd be a fun mission. Like, I mean, we, even because here's the thing: all the guys that all the guys that are built like they could be great gliders are yeah. seeing the abilities and capabilities of the rotational movement and how it can create force. So even those guys are going to the rotation because they're like, I can throw even further. Yeah. Like Philip from UVA, uh, Mihaljevic. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, so whatever. But He's built like David Storl and all those guys, yeah. you know, like those guys who could who could glide, right? But you know, he's going to throw twenty two meters really soon. Yeah, they came you through know, here and, last year, man, and like, and they're they were they were. I mean, Sandra's impressive, of course, but yeah, Philip was too, and like, I think he's like, and he's still pretty young. Yeah, uh, uh, like like training age young for shot put. Um, anyway, yeah, I was I was impressed when they came through. Yeah. So, do you ever use any um, sports psychology resources? Like, how how do you deal with I don't know pain, tragedy, like like the ups and downs of training on a daily basis and not reaching goals? Like, how do you deal with that? Man, you know, I don't use the I don't utilize sports psychologists and stuff like that, right? But maybe I will. Um, I'm just I'm one to take everything and carry it my own and, and deal with it that way. Is it healthy? I don't know. 
<laughs> but it just, you know, it just, it just is what it is. I think uh, as men, especially black men, we we aren't raised and taught to want to outsource our pain and discomfort no. and want to go talk to other people, right? No. You know, that's just not how we were brought up. So subconsciously, I don't, I have not chosen to outsource and talk to anybody about anything I might be dealing with. So I just sit with myself and try to. Uh, process things as evenly as I can, removing emotion and be live and make logical decisions, uh, and just kind of play everything for what it is. You know, I think I have a pretty logical brain, so I don't go too far one way or the other. Like I don't, I try not to get too low. Um, and even if I am low, I allow myself to be there because I think you know the only way to get through something is to kind of be in that state. You know, is try to instead of trying to move forward too fast. I was not happy. Uh, and I think I might have dealt with. I don't want. I don't like using the D word, bro, because it's a you know a clinical term and whatever. But yeah. I would. It's a slippery dip- slope. <laughs> no, so I won't like. I, I won't even pretend to you know act as if the things I was dealing with were on that high level. But I can't find a better word. So depression esque feeling, dude. Like I was, you know, if you think I spent so much time uh, working trying to. Uh, push myself to this limit and I've seen so myself do so many things uh you know you know feeling like I could compete and, and win and be better than everyone and do all these things I want to achieve and then to watch things the season kind of transpire in a way and then people just come tell you hey good job you did great and you're just like no I did not I did great for you but I understand like I'm and then you try to tell people, right? Like, you don't, you don't get it. You, you got, you had to have seen this, and they, they can't see it because they weren't. Then it shuts down. Right. They're like, uh, right. Yeah, that. right. And then, and then you're, and then you're that guy telling yeah. people, you know, what your training was like, and how things went, right? So I, I and I, everyone hates that guy. So I will never be that guy. So yeah, I was not, you know, not happy about that, man. And it was so. It took me, it took me a, a while to uh, want to talk about it. Uh, want to just what experience you know, is this? What year? This is last year. This, this is, is last year. So world. Yeah. Seven. Yeah. And so, I mean, last year, just the season in general was pretty tough. So, you know, trying to figure out how to deal with that, it took me a while. I had to just kind of sit in it and, and be home and and just go through that process and allow myself to feel all those feels and then figure out how I can transfer it into trying to be better and moving forward. And that was the process. I mean – I mean, maybe you're picking stuff up or you're, you're doing some of your own research on your own, but I mean, but like, I got to believe in, you know, I'm no psychologist either or whatever, but um, sitting with those, those sort of feelings is, is probably absolutely what you need to do. Right. Like, like there would be more damage by ignoring or just trying to, just trying to shove deep down, you know what I mean? And and that sort of thing doesn't, uh, I mean, it can work. But that's one of those short-term things, right? And then you just put it in there, and it's just drama. <laughs> and like, and when, and you know what I mean? Yeah, man, you get that, you get that kind of emotional trauma that essentially manifests in your body, and and we use our bodies, right? Yep. And, and the energy is just not going to flow right. So, um, yep. I like, I like what you got to say. I mean, that's that's all really good. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a never going process, man. And I think it's a never going process still today. Just trying to, you know, because even this season was has been going. It's just, it's been it's been real up and down. It's been weird. Um, but that's why all this this uh, coronavirus stuff for me. I mean, like it's gonna work for me. It's unfortunate that we are in this state, and I need the world to heal so we can get back to just being a, a people in a a population of just health and being able to go kind of leave your house and do stuff. But athletically, uh, I will be one of the people who will extremely benefit from the Olympics being moved to 2021. There are, I don't know if there's, I think a lot of people will see it next year and they will feel the same way, but I see it immediately. Yeah. I'm like, Oh yeah. I'm like, you know, I've been pushing myself so hard since 2014, you know, trying to do great in every season you know, when you get to this high level, it's it's a really high level, but I'm pushing hard every year, I'm lifting more weight, I'm running harder, I'm throwing harder, I'm pushing harder. My body is just like, whoa. Last year was a lot, and I'm just like, I don't care. I'm going harder. And, you know, like, so my body was starting to, you know, wear down in some areas, and 
what I know I need is rest and time to recover and be healthy. But I was never going to get that. And I was okay with it because I was just like, it is what it is. Got to keep rolling. But, you know, now that they push it back a year, I'm like, oh, okay. Like now I get to take a chance to work on all the type of things that might have been causing any type of injuries or uh, yeah, yeah. technical inefficiencies to properly prepare myself to really attack my goals uh, a year from now. So what are some of those things that you're working on? Like to, I mean, if you don't mind sharing, I guess, but um, because you are a bit of a deep thinker. So I'm sure you've probably, you know, observed what your technique is doing right now, either mm -hmm. like, so either in the ring technique or out of the ring or from a mindset perspective, um, which one of those, like, where do you see the most work to be done and what are you going to do about it? I think it's the, it's technical, right? But it's, it's two, it's two parts. So for me, it's my body. I, I, I just have to say it's the body, but not in the sense of getting stronger. It's about what type of limitations do I have physically that inf influence my technique and how is it influenced it? And what is it doing in my throat that may lead to far throws or injuries or how sustainable is it for, for me to move this way long term if I don't change these things, right? So I got to say that's a perfect answer. <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Like I had, a, I had a wrist injury last year that I was dealing with, right? And I dealt with it all season, man. And it really sucked. It really hurt. And there were some points of the season that I was really not happy, but whatever. It, it, I got through it. And so – it wasn't all the way until I was working with somebody, you know, later in the season that they were just like, yo, you have like your scaps and everything is so tight and so pressed forward that I'm loading the shot put in a different position that's putting so much more stress on my wrist. And I'm throwing forces that are beyond 22 meters, you know, and I'm singling out my wrist. So there I go with a wrist injury, right? And so I, I treat my wrist, I treat my wrist, treat my wrist the whole season. And it's not the problem. It's the problem is that I am so tight and wound in one area in my shoulder and my scap that I'm just out of position. So I don't even have my larger muscle group supporting me when I go to throw. So how do I alleviate this technical problem I have is like I have to fix my flexibility and my scap and my traps and all those motions so that I can load the shot put in a better position to not have my wrist doing all the work. And maybe down the line that'll lead to less injury and less stress. So that's just one thing for myself that I look at. That would be the idea. So who do, who are you working like with or what kind of, not who like, you know, names or anything, but like, yeah, you know, is this a uh, the, train, the, train, the training staff here at the training center, you know, yeah. so uh, Kairos and athletic, ther like, a, you know, just a bunch of manual therapists and, uh, you know, here at the training center. So that entire group. And that's, that's going and, well. And so you strength coaches and we're, we're all kind of in tune. On that. Yeah. Right on. And yeah. And Jamie's like, Jamie's really good. Yeah, he's uh, the man. So, I mean, <laughs> the year, the year is, is, is what it is. And right. it would have been nice to ask what the goals are, but like, I mean, still, you know what I mean? So <laughs> Olympics are postponed for sure. Um, mm -hmm. Which of course means Olympic trials are postponed, but there will most likely still be a U.S. champs at some point, probably, you know what I mean? Like much later, right? Like, right. Yeah. Just later is is the only fact that I know later. So, um, like, what what kind of goals like are you trying to to do? Like, does that does Corona and the Olympic trials and and all of those things changing? Does that change what the goal is? Besides, you know it what does. I mean, winning the goal. Yeah. Right? Obviously, that that goal is yeah. off the table, but it definitely changes the goal because the year kind of changes. It's like it's not a championship year, but uh, I still want like in short i have one goal you know i have a few goals but whatever my one main goal is i have to throw 22 meters again this year and the reason being is because i've thrown 22 meters for three years straight i'm a weird stats nut and i want to keep a 22 meter streak going as long as i can because historically it's not common i think ryan might be in the lead he's got five years because he's thrown 22 meters into it. five years straight tom walsh is behind him at four Joe also had four, 14, 15, 16, 17, yeah, four in a row. Uh, and this would be my fourth in a row. And uh, I don't – and Christian Cantwell, I think, had one. I think he might have had four years. 
but try to be amongst, you know, when you stack yourself up, when you retire, you know, things that can, uh, you can use for your argument of, be, you know, becoming the greatest. And I want, you know, having a 22 meter streak as long as I can make one uh, a goal of mine. So if they have competitions this year, I want, I will, I plan to be a part of them. And, and the goal of mine is to, you know, just be over 22 meters again so I can keep that rolling. Yeah, I like that. That's, that's uh, respectable. Um, I'm trying to think like in, in hammer, I think the record for most years over 80 meters is, is not me. It's, um, Igor Stopkovich. I think it was 14 years. This dude over 80 meters. Crazy. Like that's almost how long have I been a pro man? I've been a pro like about that, maybe 15, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, like I could even imagine throwing, 80 meters every single year I was a pro man and his last year he was like 42 when he did it like yeah bro like and I think bro. and I think like if I think people you know we're we're spoiled well not me because I get it but like <laughs> the fans of the fans of throwings are spoiled right now because they don't understand what's going on in the shot put cool. you know like like when I tell you Ryan's thrown 22 for five years in a row and I'm not sure that it I'm not sure anyone else has ever done that like so somebody had to stat check that, but I'm really not sure if anyone else had ever done that, right? You got Tom behind him at four, and, you know, if he throws this year, I'm sure he's going to throw 22, so he'll be at five also. And God willing myself, I'll be at four. You know, like, these longevity stats, you know, we, we're we living in crazy times for the shot put, you know. So those are the type of things I want to be a part of, man, and, and trying to just put together a legacy long term of consistency and at a high level, you know. And I mean, my it's been four years. It'd be, it'd be three three years of roll over twenty two thirty something too for me. So you know, my standards a little higher. I'm trying to keep it above twenty two thirty. So right now is my lowest twenty two year is twenty two thirty five, which is this last year twenty two thirty five. You know, so if I can keep them all above twenty two thirty, you know, that'd be crazy. But that's my you know that's what I want to do. Cool. Are you a th uh, are you a reader thinker? I, you know, I need to read more. I buy books, right? I buy books. I have like a stack of books I plan to read, right? And I just never get around to it. And I always tell myself, you know, this is what I'm going to start a book. I'm going to start a book, start a book. Um, so it's really one of the things that I want to improve about myself. Because when I get reading, I just finish the book. Yeah. But it's the, it's the process of getting me to sit down and start the book. Uh, but, yeah, so. Well, that's all right. Um, these last few questions is, is, is yo, you, got, you got any book suggestions for me? Like, what yeah. is there a book that you say, yo, you got to read this? I'll read it. Uh, so I mentioned I finished this one now, but I mentioned it on the Susie podcast, The Way of the Superior Man. I'm looking at it right now. Uh, I got it. I have it. I have you got it. that with a read it. Okay, I'll read it. Um, and then I just started, uh, the inner game of tennis which is like okay. you know what i mean just take out tennis and throw in shot but like and it's 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 good so far it's really good um and then i read like a bunch of just random articles too but right you know we got all this time now like <laughs> like, right, like it's, it's probably a perfect time i'm gonna start that book i'll probably start today it's yeah. a good time to start yeah what do you want people to say about you when you know i don't know maybe not right when you retire what do you want people to say about you 20 years after you retire uh he was relentless you know he didn't quit he was a, a you know he inspired others he, he he tried to move the mark for a demographic of people that have been underrepresented in the sport uh he was a true ambassador you know of the sport and, and what great this could be. He just he just tried to move in the mark is, is my biggest thing. I, I think that my career, I said it a long time ago, you know, I plan to achieve all these things, but I, I don't think it's for me. You know, I think it's just about being a blueprint for somebody else to come by, behind and, and see things that are possible, you know. like So I wear that, that hat, you know, I try to wear it well. So uh, I'd like to just have people think that, you know, I, I, I did everything I could do. I, I, I represented the sport and our people extremely well, and I just inspired some people to tr to go do something great, whether it be shot put or whatever it could be, you know, like just try to inspire people to do something. Yeah, yeah, I like that. 
Uh, I feel similarly about um, about Hammer, and it always it. I mean, it usually changes, right? You know, in the first few years, it's a little bit more self-centered. Uh, yeah. But like, I mean, and for good reason. Like, you're trying to do something for yourself, or that you think you you can do for for whatever the motivation is. But at some point, it definitely changed to this is kind of a big picture thing. Right. And and, and looking at Hammer, right, like hammer in our in our country has a very proud and rich tradition but in terms of like success and results like it just hasn't really been there except for the one-off couple guys every you know generation or two right um and so i think i kind of took that on like this is more about like this this throwing and this training and this learning and understanding is not like it's not really for you know me and also from like from the community too, right? <laughs> Being a black man, there's there's only like we yeah. Alex now, and then I guess I mean, and there's some other guys too, like in the college ranks, and I'll see them like on Instagram or something. But like there ain't that right. many, you know what I mean? No. I mean playing, no. you know, football and basketball and all that stuff, and like yeah. and all those things growing up, man. It was like, why don't you play football? Well, I mean, I did. Yeah. I really good. I just chose to do this. <laughs> I don't know why. That's just what I chose. I think even even furthering it on the athletic state of what people, what I want people to remember me for. Um, we are, like I said, I keep always harking back to what time we live in in the shot put. And I am so, so grateful for it uh, because the story is going to be cool, man. I just, I know there's going to be a story to be told, you know, about this time. And for me, it's about making sure that my role in the story is, is excellent. You know, so that's what this next year is about for me is, it's kind of turning the tables on, you know, where my name is viewed in the in the ranks of, you know, what this shot put is. We got a, so many. I mean, obviously you watch Worlds. So I, I, I'll, I'll spare you the details on how good people are, right? Um, but I think I'm better. And so if I can overcome this, you know, then that's that's pretty special, you know. So that's that's kind of that's kind of what I'm excited about. That challenge of of overcoming the craziest odds that they are, you know, three guys over 2290, another Brazilian dude over 2250, and then there's me, you know, who a lot of people like to forget about, but I can't wait to to, to, to write that story my way. I don't forget about you, buddy. <laughs> 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 what, uh, now that we're kind of on that topic, like what, like, hmm, I'm not sure what the best question is here, but essentially, What's the vibe like when, you know, the top five or six of you are around? So I don't, I don't know if the question is like in competition or you yeah. know what I mean? like in the warm up area, like what's, what's that vibe like? Like just kind of give, I think people a glimpse of like, what's it like it's when it was ready? Interesting, man. It's, it's, it's such an interesting dynamic because as you get closer to the championship, things tighten up a bit, right? But every, it's all love at the same time. Like, Romani, the Brazilian guy, he doesn't speak much English, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, he was my roommate one time at Prefontaine, yeah. and all he did was FaceTime his family and his kids. So I immediately just was like, we don't, you know, we can't really communicate, but you are all right with me. Like, I know his, his principles are aligned in the right place, so I have a lot of respect for him. And, like, he'll always just say hello. So there's not much from him because he doesn't speak English. But that also adds a, a level of, like, he's just doing his own thing. And then you got... Uh, Ryan, who I, he's my counterpart because we're NCAA same year. Like we've been the same year since high school. So uh, he's probably the closest with me out of any of the shot putters on the circuit, you know. Uh, so it's always love between him and watching him just, you know, be great and do his thing. And then Joe, obviously I train with Joe. And Joe's in a different space today. Uh, being with Ashley, a way more relaxed Joe, which is a dangerous Joe to me, you know. Yeah, I, man. I was, I was <laughs> telling anybody who wanted to listen and I'll stand by it because I want people were people were counting Joe out and I was just telling people man I said nah I'm watching this happen dude and I, I, I'm just, like I told you I'm a stats guy I won't share what stats I know about what made me kind of know what was on the horizon but I, I watched the stats I was watching him move around and I said nah he's he, something good is on the way and yeah. so uh, watching him work and then Tom Tom's like a Tom's a little older than me, but he's like a little brother. He's always picking at people, you know, he's just picking at you, picking at you in a friendly way. Like it's, it's, it's all love. So it's fun. And being out there like on the, on the field with those guys, it's just intense because it's everybody's 
cool. It's not like there's real problems, but everyone wants to beat everyone. It is evident. It is clear. Like, when the competition starts, everyone is immediately going for blood, and I love it. it but then we also can go get beers afterwards. Like, maybe not Worlds because that's, you know, it's tough. But, like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's tough, right? You know, like, it's, you know, it's either you won and people, everybody's been working with that for a year, right? So later down the line, you can kick it about it, talk about it. But that means you achieved the goal someone didn't. So people feel differently about that. But it's all love, man. It's, it's a great, great, crazy environment. Oh, that's cool. So, um I think I kind of want to know, like, maybe one more thing. So, like, what's your favorite memory? What sticks out for you um, in these few years of being a professional shot putter, like, on your travels or, or what else? Like, what, what kind of, you know, what, what's something that you share when people are like, you know, what's it like or where do you want to go? I think for me, it's not even like, and this will probably be answered differently, like, my favorite part about this whole thing is when you're on those teams, right, and you're in the lounge or you're in the dining area with all these elite athletes, right, and everybody's just kind of kicking it. And you just are talking to people you might have looked up to. Like, I still remember, like, when I, I feel like when we were in Toronto for Pan Ams, you know what I'm saying, we sat down in the dining hall for hours, me, you, John Jones, uh, David Oliver, and Wallace Spearman, right? Yeah. You guys are sitting there talking to us for hours about what this sport is like, the business of it, right? And I'm sitting there with everything but a pen and paper out, right? Like just sponging up all the information. But those conversations, like that's where the real growth happens in our sport, you know? So I always try to tell people to be cognizant of those moments and don't be that guy that's, you know, staying in your room all the time. Like just come out because there's, there's knowledge and information and relationships that are are to be made in, in those times where people aren't working, you know? So those type of things are what I look forward to the most. Um, and those are probably the things that I will remember the most outside of anything that has to do with me throwing a shot. Cause you don't, you don't have anybody else, you know, you'd be sitting in the middle of, you know, freaking Germany and every, all the food places are closed, man, but you hungry and five other people are hungry. So you just sitting there talking about how hungry you are. I mean, like, you, you know, like, <laughs> Or you're all shared in a struggle, you know, so being in those environments, you know, creates a lot of relationships. So that's what I like the most. Yeah, man, track, track's a beautiful sport. And it's like, yeah. it's, it's one of those bridges. Don't no matter where you're from. <laughs> Don't matter, what, you know, what, what color your, your skin is, man. Like, it's, it's yeah. really amazing. Yep. So, man, like, so where can people find you here? We're, we're going to wrap up. Um, you're on Instagram. Instagram. I'm on everything. I'm on. I'm on everything. Instagram is at b1g homie underscore. So it's big homie with a one instead of an i. Uh, on Twitter, it's just at big homie no underscore. And also, you can go follow my YouTube channel. You can just search my name, uh, or you can search feet in the streets with big homie. Uh, we're in this coronavirus thing, so I've been kind of. Right. I didn't even ask you about feet in the streets. <laughs> talk about that too but it's been kind of weird trying to get that set up i'm kind of trying to let things figure out but we'll be back making videos very soon but yeah go check that out go learn how to cook and and all yeah all that stuff so yeah well then i got two plugs for you okay first you're gonna need some meat <laughs> to 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 feed the streets i i I, I'm a, I have a response to this when you say it i know what you're about to say stay go classy first. stay classy meats stay classy meats I tried to create a relationship with Stay Classy Me. Yeah? And it didn't work? And this was a while ago, and it, in, in short, it didn't work, right? But I'm willing to build the bridge. You know, build that bridge. I'm willing to, yeah, I'm willing to build the bridge, man. You know, so I, I, would, I would like to stay classy, but they didn't want to stay classy with the big home. So hmm. we'll, see, we'll see if they change their... their I'm asking about it, too. We'll see. Because, I mean, especially, like, and it's it's... It's been, I mean, I don't know how the grocery stores are out there, but out here, like, madness. beef, madness. steak, chicken is gone. Yeah, yeah. And these guys still have yeah. all of this high quality, man. Like, it, it's been great. Yeah, I, I, I think, it, I think especially now, I mean, like, I think it's a per, it'd be a perfect time for us to have a relationship, you know, like, with what's going on, with what I'm trying to do, uh, with what their interests are. I think our interests align perfectly. Yeah. Uh, truthfully. Um, so, you know, 
maybe we'll have another conversation. But I'm, I, you know, I'm trying to stay classy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we're all classy. And uh, beard, what you do with that beard, man? Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> so free, free, free plug for this company. This is actually I use some different moisturizer stuff to wash, but I got some uh, Rich by Rick Ross beard oil going. Oh on yeah. Here. Yeah, Rich by Rick Ross uh, beard oil is good, man. You don't need too much, or else you can be shining like. It's, you know, the, it's like, all natural though. Like it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, nice. No, nah, I don't do that. I don't do nothing crazy. Yeah, they got they got a really good product. So I use like the natural black girl, uh, natural black girl products for my beard. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I got talk, I talked to some of my sisters and they gave me some recommendations on uh, natural hair products and I use those type of things. And then, but the real one is the uh, the beard oil. I like that. One. Cool. All right, man. Well, thank you for uh, for coming on the show. This has been fun. Of course, bro. Of course, man. Thank you for having me, bro. I hope this was the the greatest episode of all time, man. We were, when I retire, when we both retire, because you're still active too, we do another one. All right. Yeah. And then, well, and then wrap it all up. Yeah, well, these these Olympics being postponed, like <laughs> I'm over here, like. Who <laughs> 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 are so you are still planning though? 2021. Yeah. Man, next. Uh, we'll see, man. Like, like. Whatever, whatever, and whenever this U.S. champs goes down this year, like basically, I'm still training, and I'm going to keep training. You know, right. probably through summer and, and early and early fall or whatever, um, mm-hmm. and then reassess then, man. But like, I came back for this year, and it's been pretty premeditated. Like, I, I never really, I never hit the fact yeah. that I was going to come back again. Um, mm-hmm. But. Um, it's just it's different now, man. Like these boys are bringing it, and like, and it's and it's good. Right. So you know, I'll by say, next I'll year, say this, I'll say I'll say this, bro. This Olympics is gonna be the biggest ever. I know, I know. It's gonna be the, especially with, with the climate of the world, the eye that we have on the Olympics. You know what I'm saying? It's gonna be the biggest ever, bro. So if you can find some strength to to keep it going for a year, Ooh. I think it serves. I think it serves you well, bro. I might have I to. Too, is like, and the other thing too is like Japan is seriously like one of my favorite countries, man. And like, yeah, right. <laughs> like think this is think about it this way: the coronavirus year is not the way you retire. Bro. Yeah, oh, damn it. <laughs> yeah, I'm like yeah. it's not. It's just not. It's just not. Actually, it could also be full circle, man, because my first, my first major was Osaka 2007. So damn. I could, I could go out. Tokyo 2021. Yeah. I can't so, even do that now. That's how long I've been around, man. This is crazy. All right. That's a, that's a time, bro. Terrell, thanks, man. And um, no problem, bro. we'll catch you around. All right, bro. God bless, man. Yeah, man. You too. All right. Later.